I'm Sarana. I work at SickKids. I'm just finishing up a postdoc uh, uh, and working with um, clonal heterogeneity in brain tumors. Uh, so I'm interested in a pediatric brain cancer called medulloblastoma. And uh, in January, I'll be moving to Calgary, where I'm going to start my own group, um, also looking at uh, cancer evolution and heterogeneity. So today, I'm going to tell you about uh, somatic copy number alterations in cancer. And tomorrow, we're going to talk about uh, mutations in cancer. And hopefully, I'll teach you everything I know about this topic, although I'm sure there are lots of things um, uh, that others on the panel um, are also able to chime in with. Um, so just a note on the lecture, uh, some of the slides that I used are um, um, from le a lecture given in the past uh, on this topic from Saurabh Shah, so um, um, uh, uh, thanks to him for those, and then a lot of the slides I, um, are new for this year. And so just to look at learning objectives uh, for this module, basically we're going to um, kind of have an overview of uh, the impact of copy number al aberrations in cancer. Uh, we're going to discuss genomic instability, mm -hmm. cancer evolution, and genetic heterogeneity. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about tumor suppressor genes versus oncogenes. Um, and we'll talk about exam some examples of actionable alterations. And then we'll dive a little bit more into how we detect copy number aberrations, um, what are some of the compounding factors we have to account for, uh, and, and strategies to overcome th uh, these, so things like purity and ploidy of, of tumors, um, and also intratumoral heterogeneity. Uh, and then we'll uh, finish up by looking at specific measurement technologies and computational tools. So we're going to focus on arrays and uh, whole genomes and exomes. And so before we start, can you guys tell me, just with a show of hands, how many people have done copy number analysis before? A few. How many people want to do copy number analysis as part of their work? Quite a few more. OK, great. OK, so you've already heard, uh, I think, from Trevor's lecture that cancer is a disease of the genome. Uh, so tumorigenesis is really this multi-step process that requires uh, a series of several mutations. And each mutation drives a wake of expansion um, of these cells that harbor the mutation. So if the mutation cover confers a highly advantageous uh, phenotype to the cell, those cells outcompete their neighbors. So we can see these um, on this graph. The initiator mutations are in gray. And then subsequent uh, mutations that confer a selective advantage are these, generate these green clones um, or these orange clones. Mutations that don't uh, confer a selective advantage are not selected for, and so they remain at a constant frequency or eventually disappear. Uh, and so when we have a huge selective pressure, like therapy in this case, uh, this time point is uh, disease resection and then treatment, um, what we see is a huge population drop and then preferential survival of those cells that are resistant to the treatment. Um, and so in this particular illustration, we can see that the genotype of all the cells in the recurrent tumor um, still contain all those initiating mutations, the gray background. Uh, but uh, we can see that uh, they have a completely different genotype than the tumor at diagnosis. So this red clone is now the majority of cells where it was a very small minority to begin with. And so malignant cells within a single tumor uh, can significantly differ from each other uh, both in space, uh, so in different regions of the tumor, and in time if we track a tumor uh, longitudinally. And uh, very rarely is a tumor 100% pure. I don't know how many of you guys are planning to work with, uh, <laughs> uh, with mouse models of disease. Perhaps that's one case where you can have a, a pure uh, sample. Uh, medulloblastoma, in my case, I'm pretty lucky. Medulloblastoma is about 90 plus percent pure. But many cancers have um, as low as 30 percent purity. And so often tumor tumors will contain um, infiltrating cells like these immune inflammatory cells, as well as uh, many other types of cells from the microenvironment um, and basically the, the stroma, so the stroma. And so the presence and compositions of these other uh, cells can significantly change the biology of the tumor. So for instance, it might make it less or more resistant to uh, chemotherapy. So I'm not going to go into uh, detail on the microenvironment, but I, I mention it because uh, we are increasingly appreciating that actually it's a combination of genetically distinct clonal lineages uh, of the malignant cells and the tumor microenvironment that together are involved in the pathogenesis of some and, and maybe all cancers. Uh, and so, in fact, our 
foundation for understanding the biology of cancers, uh, which you guys talked about on the first day, can really be described as the set of six hallmarks. Uh, so these are the acquired functional capabilities of ca that enable cancer cells to survive, to proliferate, and to metastasize. Um, so the acquisition of these capabilities is actually made possible by two enabling characteristics. Um, and so uh, uh, one of which is inflammation from the microenvironment, and the one relevant to our discussion today is genomic instability. So genomic instability enables uh, cancer cells to, uh, to have the genetic alterations that drive uh, tumor progression. Um, and so uh, understanding tumor biology is then really an exercise in <laughs> measuring and detecting these divergent clonal populations. Um, and linking these to disease progression and response to treatment. And one way to infer that a certain clonal lineage has an, uh, a selective advantage or a fitness advantage is to measure its uh, frequency in the population. However, there are significant confounding variables uh, to consider. So today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, two of them, normal contamination by non-malignant cells um, uh, found in the tumor stroma and the simultaneous presence of these multiple genetically distinct lineages, uh, which have different copy numbers and relative frequencies, and those things have to be deconvoluted uh, so that we can understand what's really a driver event in these cancers. Okay, so before delving uh, into the nitty-gritty details of how we do the analysis, let's go over some uh, background and copy number alterations. Um, this is a normal human karyotype. You guys have seen this plot before. Uh, this is a spectrokaryogram with chromosome painting, and so each chromosome shows up as a, as a unique color. Um, and it really makes it easy to appreciate that actually the structure of the human genome is diploid with two copies of each chromosome, uh, one from each parent. Now, the chromosome theory of inheritance uh, is over 110 years old, and so uh, it was independently proposed by two scientists, Sutton and Bovary. Uh, they identified chromosomes as the linear structures that carry the genetic material uh, of a cell and which behave in a way that's concordant with Mendel's uh, rules of inheritance. And so they're present in all dividing cells, um, and they pass from one generation to the next. So this scientist, Bovary, was a, a biologist. He was interested in um, cell organization and his work was focused on embryonic development in sea urchins. And he observed uh, that a certain phenotype of high proliferation and growth was often associated with a change in copy number of one of the chromosomes. And so he actually made the link uh, that human cancer and cancerous growth is actually a result of aberrations in um, chromosome structure that would cause cells to pr proliferate uncontrollably. And in 1960, he was proven correct when uh, one folks discovered that uh, CML is caused by a fusion between two genes, BCR able. So now these genomes are from ovarian carcinomas, uh, which have some of the highest burden of copy number aberrations in cancers. Uh, they look nothing like the normal karyotype uh, we saw earlier. And it's obvious from these images that copy number changes um, are a major feature of cancer. And so it makes sense to study the copy number profiles in detail to get insight into these tumors. Uh, they're actually really laborious to produce, uh, but pretty fascinating to look at. So I'll just point out a few uh, key features. One is um, you can spot chromosomal translocations uh, because we have two colors um, uh, stuck. Uh, so we have these chromosomes that have two colors. You can see where different parts of uh, different chromosomes are now stuck together. Um, Second, it's obvious that these are not actually diploid genomes. So in many of these cases, we can see, if you can look at chromosome 1, you can see many, many copies of chromosome 1. And so some of these tumors have a ploidy of 3 or 4 or 6 or even more. So this means that at some point in the evolution of these cancers, there was a whole genome duplication event. So that's exactly what it sounds like. At some point, uh, mitosis failed in a way, and instead of evenly dividing uh, the chromosomes to two daughter cells, all the chromosomes uh, went to one daughter cell. So genome duplication events are um, one of the ways in which, uh, where the, they're a fairly pre prevalent feature in cancer, and they're one of the ways in which um, these, uh, um, the building blocks uh, of these chaotic genomes uh, are, are made available. 
Um, and I lastly want to point out that we mostly see broad events here. So we see events involving whole chromosome arms or whole chromosomes, but there are plenty of focal events that we can detect with finer resolution methods. Okay, so conceptually, uh, we can imagine how copy number alteration uh, might appear when we consider the structure of a chromosome. So we see a chromosome here on the left and on the right in these two images. Um, and specifically, we want to see how that structure is different between a normal sample and a tumor sample. Um, and so uh, just a note on nomenclature is that copy number alterations or aberrations are actually uh, what we use to refer to somatic changes. Um, so these are present in the tumor cells and not the normal, whereas copy number variations um, are actually polymorphisms present in the general population. So there are databases of common uh, copy number variations that we would use to rule out uh, specific gains or losses as uh, putative drivers. Okay, so we're talking about somatic amplifications or deletions. So these are changes that involve between one KB of DNA to a whole arm. Um, and so deletions reflect the loss of DNA content and uh, ideally loss of a tumor suppressor gene, um, whereas amplification uh, involve gain of, uh, of DNA content and multiple copies of things like oncogenes. So these are the hallmarks of tumor genomes um, and loss of tumor suppressor genes and, um, and gain of oncogenes. <coughs> Okay, so before we look at some examples of data, I want to mention heterozygosity. Um, so the concept here is that our genomes are peppered with, uh, with these positions that vary naturally between individuals. Uh, so these are single nucleotide, uh, nucleotide polymorphisms. You've heard of SNPs um, earlier. Um, and so, in fact, there are about 10 million or so of these polymorphic positions in our genomes. Um, and for ease of nomen nomenclature, um, the two alleles that are most common in the human population are, term, are termed A. Uh, sorry, the allele that's most common is termed A, and the allele that's least common is termed C. So it could be that at a specific position in our genomes, 80% um, of us in the room have a, a G, and the rest of us have an A. So the G would be the A allele, and the A would be the B allele. Um, and so here, in this image, we see three three positions, three SNPs, uh, and this individual has AA, so the genotype at the first position is uh, homozygous A, at the second position it's AB, and at the third position is homozygous B. So when we see a duplication, uh, this changes because now we have another copy of the A and the B, so we have three A's, so uh, we say that the genotype is now triplicate, three A, and the heterozygous position becomes ABB, and the homozygous B remains BB because it's not involved in the, in the copy number event. Uh, when we have a hemizygous deletion, so we just delete one copy, uh, we lose heterozygosity at this position. So we are left with A and A. And in the case of homozygous deletions, we just lose uh, both alleles. Um, so another pattern of mutations that marks tumor suppressor genes is copy neutral loss of heterozygosity often coupled with a somatic mutation. Um, so the idea here is that typically there's a loss of function mutation in one allele of a tumor suppressor. So this is denoted um, by this red uh, mark here at the A, on the A allele. And then the tumor gets rid of the other copy uh, through a process, for instance, like non-disjunction, uh, which is uh, um, an error in uh, the, division, the mitotic division. Uh, and then duplication of the A allele. So now we have two copies of the mutated tumor suppressor gene. So this is often uh, a pattern of aberrations that is specific for, for tumor suppressors. So, and this is something to keep an eye out for when analyzing data. Okay, so let's look at some copy number data uh, for chromosome 15. This is the type of plot that you'll see over and over uh, in this module, in the lab, and in publications. Uh, the lower panel, or below the lower panel, we see the chromosome. Um, it turns out that the p-arm of this chromosome is too repetitive and doesn't have any uh, useful data, so we are just looking at the copy number variation on the q-arm. Um, and so 
uh, on the bottom panel, we see the log ratio of the copy number. So ideally, in a well-designed experiment, you're always testing the copy number state of your tumor versus a normal. And ideally, the normal is matched. Sometimes you can get around uh, having a match normal, but that is the ideal scenario. And then the way that copy number is presented is the log ratio to the match normal. So a log ratio of zero means that there's no difference between the copy number in the tumor and the copy number in the normal. And so for most of this chromosome, we can see that there's a log ratio of zero with a small gain here and a larger gain here. So these are values on the y-axis that um, are above zero. Um, and then on the top, we have a plot showing the, the B allele frequency. Um, and so uh, for the majority of the chromosome, that's heterozygous. <coughs> So this person has AB, so is heterozygous for most of these uh, uh, most of these positions along the chromosome, uh, or is homozygous for the B allele or homozygous for the A allele. So we see this pattern of 0.5 being heterozygosity, and then 0 and 1, um, showing that some some positions in the genome um, are homozygous. Um, and so when we have a copy number gain, so here we have three copies. Uh, we now see a departure from the heterozygous state because instead of having AB at a majority of positions, now we have ABB or AAB. So instead of 0.5, we see a shift towards 0.3 and 0.6. And we still see 0 and 1 because we can still have triple A and triple B. And when we have a bigger copy number gain uh, of an additional copy, we can see a pattern uh, of 0.25. 0.5, 0.75, and then the 0 and the 1. And in copy neutral LOH, where you have no difference in copy number, so if we just had copy number, we would never focus on this region at all. Uh, but when we look at the B allele frequency, we see that there's a dramatic shift from 0.5 out to 0 and 1. So we've completely lost heterozygosity there. So these are the kinds of features that uh, we look for when we analyze copy number data. We look at the copy number ratio. And then we look at the B allele frequency, and together they tell us um, the state, uh, the copy number state uh, along the chromosome. Yes. So I'm sorry if it's really obvious, but how would you know it's not A B C? Like, how would you know? Like, are, is it by your knowledge of the chromosome or the gene itself, or if it's a three copy number variation? So most positions that are um, used for this kind of analysis are heterozygous in the germline of the person or in populations. And so, yes, you're right, uh, you know, most of us are G or T at a particular position, but some of us will have an A. Uh, it will be a very small percentage. Uh, and usually, the, this type of data is, um, uh, does not account for, for that low, low frequency um, and most SNPs have a major and a minor allele. Uh, and when we're going to talk later about uh, the way that SNPs are chosen to be put on, uh, for instance, the Affymetric SNP6 array, they're chosen to be biallelic. So we usually just have two alleles um, of interest at a particular position. Any other questions? This is a pretty important plot. Yes. <laughs> So this is one of the trickier things to get about, um, about this kind of data. So let me go back to this. So B allele is the minor allele in the population. And so each person at each SNP position, like we all have, let's say, 3 million SNPs. Or we actually have about 10 million SNPs, but at many positions we're homozygous. Um, and so we're either homozygous for the A allele for the allele that most people in the population have, or were homozygous for the B allele, the allele that's more uh, rare in the general population, or were heterozygous. So one of these chromosomes in, is inherited from your mom, and one is from your dad. Right? So it depends on what the genotype of your mom and dad was. Um, and so when we talk about the B allele frequency, it's, it's actually whatever that B allele was. So if it's the C, if it's, a, if it's a heterozygous position and it's a GC, and you lose copies of the chromosome that carry the C, then your B allele uh, goes down to zero, towards zero. 
and your A allele will consequently go up towards 1. Yes. Yeah, so uh, over many regions in the genome, people are heterozygous for these positions. So you'll have a frequency of 0.5. And when you lose heterozygosity or when you gain a copy, you'll gain just one of the two copies, or you could gain both. You could have a copy gain of two, where you've gained one of each chromosome, and then you've maintained heterozygosity. Uh, so here's another, maybe this is more helpful, here's another example uh, where we see a diploid area of this particular chromosome and with a, a B allele, so the allelic ratio is 0.5. This is like a normal part of the genome. Oops, nothing, nothing has happened to it. Uh, next to it is a single copy gain. So we, sh we see a shift now uh, out from the 0.5. If we have a deletion, we also see a shift. We no longer have heterozygosity. So the pattern to look for is heterozygosity and then loss of heterozygosity in different ways. And here, you can see at the end of this chromosome, we have a copy-neutral loss of heterozygosity. So the copy number ratio is, uh, does that say zero? Yes, it says zero. So there's no copy number gain or loss, but we can see that there's no heterozygosity over the end of this chromosome. So this is what happened, what I was showing a couple of slides ago, where you lose this region on one, uh, let's say the maternal allele, and then that allele is duplicated and the paternal is lost. Uh, we also see an amplification here. This is a focal amplification. So this is the way that oncogenes are often uh, gained and activated. And we also see a homozygous deletion in, in this light green. Uh, so this is a kind of a classic uh, way for tumor suppressor genes to be deleted. It's focal events uh, often target things like P10 and CDK and 2A. Um, here's another example uh, where we have actually really deep uh, sequencing data from a tumor that generates this very clean uh, profile. So on top we have the copy number uh, ratio, so log r, log ratio of zero being normal. And on the bottom we see the beta allele frequency. Um, and in contrast to the previous tumor, um, from this tumor, we can actually spot subclonal events. And so when we look at a region like this, monosomy 4Q, we see that there's a copy number loss of one. So we only have one allele left. Uh, our heterozygosity goes from 0.5 out to the, uh, towards zero and one. Uh, and the difference uh, is pretty dramatic. So this loss is essentially in every cell. This is an early event that uh, all cells carry. And in contrast, we can see here on chromosome 13 that there is a deletion, but it's not quite at minus one. Um, and when we look at the B allele frequency, you can see that the, uh, the shift away from heterozygosity is not as pronounced as that for chromosome four. And so this event is very likely then in a subclone of the tumor. So it's in a subset of tumor cells. And so what we can tell from this data is that monosomy four must have happened first, and then the subclonal deletion on chromosome 13 must have happened second. So you can start to time events uh, by looking at this kind of data in this way. Does that make sense? Uh, so let's look at a couple of quick examples involving driver genes. Um, this is uh, what amplification of herb B2, which is a potent oncogene, looks like. This is chromosome 17 of a breast cancer patient. Uh, so again, the x-axis is the position along the chromosome, and we can see here that where ERB2 is encoded, we have this skyscraper of red, which is essentially uh, the signal for uh, copy number gains of this locus. Um, and so the expectation here is that uh, the tumor uh, genome is diploid except for this region. Um, and so ERB2 is amplified in this way in about 15% of cancer, uh, breast cancer patients. And it's a driver that leads to proliferation and growth of cells. Uh, and patients that have this high level amplification can actually be uh, um, treated with a drug, drug called Herceptin. So this is a great example of personalized medicine based on genomic data. If you find this type of cancer or this type of mark in a, in a breast cancer patient, uh, you would think that Herceptin uh, is likely to work. And in fact, a technique that's very often used in clinical practice is fluorescence in situ hybridization, uh, 
where a fluorescent sequence sequence specific probe is used to label the genomic content of cells. And so here the blue uh, blobs are uh, the nuclei of cells. And in green, we have fluorescence for a probe that uh, binds to the copy neutral region of chromosome 17. So you can see that in most of the nuclei, uh, most of the nuclei we have two copies of chromosome 17. You can see that here. You can see that here as well. Uh, and the red probe is a probe that binds to our B2. And now you can appreciate that some of these uh, cells have hundreds of copies of our B2. And so this is a clinically approved uh, way to infer this amplification or measure it. Um, alternative ways uh, could be to look at protein um, expression through uh, immunohistochemistry, which is often done as well. Uh, and then on the other hand, uh, uh, end of the spectrum, uh, we have homozygous deletions, uh, like P10. Maybe it's a bit hard to see this tiny green blob here. Um, so this is a, a complete absence of uh, uh, copies uh, over the region of P10. It's focal, so it's very classic for a, a tumor suppressor. Um, and, and, so, and we see that it's in an area of copy neutral um, uh, LOH. Copy neutral LOH, right? Yeah. And so the clinically relevant subset of these alterations, because there are plenty of copy number gains and losses across these genomes, um, are those that are functional. Um, and we can get at, at those that are functional by looking at gene expression changes. So if you have a copy number event and the gene expression doesn't change, that means the protein expression doesn't change. And the likelihood of it being a, a driver is very low. And so that's certainly not the case for ERB2. So here in the plot on the right, we can see that uh, each dot is one patient. So this is a cohort of breast cancer patients. Um, and on the x-axis, we see copy number. And on the y-axis, we see expression. So copy neutral cases will have a variance of ERB2 expression. Uh, but as you start to gain copies of ERB2, you see a, a concordant increase in its expression. So ERB2 is not only amplified, it's also highly expressed in all cases that are amplified. Um, that's, that's generally true for focal gains and losses. And so here on the left on the top, we can see that uh, expression on the x-axis being high or low uh, is really dramatically different uh, for alterations that are either high-level amplifications that are focal or focal deletions. But when you have big, broad segments of gain and loss, that's not uh, generally the case. So you don't necessarily see uh, big differences in gene expression when you have whole chromosome arm uh, gains and losses. So um, often the consequences of uh, copy number alterations and mutations are actually difficult to predict. Uh, there are many computational approaches uh, that involve looking at amino acid changes. Um, that result from point mutations or indels, or in the case of copy numbers, looking at whether gains and losses are found more often at a particular gene than you would expect by chance. Uh, but as we saw on the last slide, it's actually important to consider other molecular measurements like gene expression. And so um, when inferring function, um, the patterns of loss of heterozygosity and copy number can be integrated with mutation and expression data to infer which genes have patterns um, that would be a corresponding to a loss of function mutation. And so in this particular paper, uh, the method XSeq uh, was applied to detect putative novel tumor suppressors across a range of cancers, so uh, 12 tumor times, 2,700 tumors, um, by looking for genes with biallelic inactivation of, uh, uh, and loss of expression, so concordant changes in their genomes and transcriptomes. OK, so just uh, to end talking about tumor suppressor genes uh, in detail, we've gone over the idea that um, uh, of the classic two-hit hypothesis, uh, where both copies of a tumor suppressor gene are required to be inactivated before uh, pathogenesis, um, uh, a, pathog uh, a phenotypic <coughs> outcome is observed. And just to complete the picture, um, we can also have what's called haploinsufficiency, uh, where you only need to lose one allele of the gene uh, in order to initiate oncogenesis. And then losing the other allele simply increases the severity of the disease. Um, and in some cases, we, ha we have what's termed quasi-insufficiency, where even a small decrease in expression can result in a, 
in a phenotype. But where the tumor cell cannot tolerate the full loss of the gene, um, because, uh, for instance, there needs to be an interaction between the wild type and the mutant allele. So there are different patterns of, of, um, of tumor suppressor loss. Um, so by looking at the gene content of these recurrent copy number alterations, um, and specifically at the high-level gains and homozygous deletions, we can see that certain genes come up over and over as targets across numerous cancers. Um, and these correspond basically to the to the known oncogenes or tumor suppressors um, that we've heard a lot about, are B2, EGFR, uh, P3 kinase, and so on, and also tumor suppressor genes, P10, and uh, I'll mention in a second BRCA1 and 2. Um, and so identifying the full repertoire uh, of these driver events in cancer, especially the more rarely mutated ones, uh, takes lots of cancer patients, um, and so large cohorts of data. So this is just a very short list of some big consortium efforts uh, that have applied either array, um, array technologies or sequencing uh, technologies to infer um, in, in many cancers and across uh, many tumor types uh, the copy number landscape uh, of cancer. And of course, the ultimate goal of all this uh, activity is to find actionable targets. So these are the genes or the pathways that cause cancer cells uh, to proliferate. And once we figure out what they are, we can develop therapeutics uh, against those targets in the hopes of better outcomes for patients. Um, and so this is a, just a brief list of uh, specific actionable targets, um, um, and specifically copy number alterations in cancer that can be therapeutically targeted. It's a pretty short list. Uh, and it's actually pretty evident, I think, that uh, gain of function events, so amplifications, are much more feasible to target with small cell or, or with small molecule drugs um, that work by inhibiting the action of a protein. When you have tumor suppressor loss, there's no small molecule that's going to easily give you back the function of that tumor suppressor. And so most of our targeted therapies are against um, gain of function mutations uh, or uh, amplifications uh, of these types of genes. And so for instance, in breast cancer, um, Every case is test tested for ERB2 positivity, and in cases where the patient shows a high-level amplification, uh, she's eligible for her septin treatment. Uh, so that's one of the poster children of personalized medicine. Um, <coughs> so in addition to guiding treatment, uh, the nature of the genomes uh, in cancer can also be used to stratify patients. Uh, so this is a nice synthesis study that shows that cancers actually reside on a spectrum, or at one end, tumors harbor um, a lot of point mutations here on the left. Um, and on the other end, they har harbor a lot of copy number alterations. And so we can infer that there's a selection either for a process that promotes defects in DNA repair that fixes double-stranded breaks and so leads to genomic instability and you have accumulation of many copy number aberrations, or a deficiency in mismatch repair that causes uh, single point mutations, single base changes. Um, and it's more rare to see uh, both of these processes operate in a single cancer, um, and, and indeed it looks like tumors kind of fall to the, out, to the outskirts of these two ranges. And so we can see that the ovarian cancers, which are this red line, um, are highly enriched in this part of the, of the spectrum, um, and they have those chaotic karyotypes we looked at, and some of the highest level of copy number and genomic instability. And so this way of stratifying patients also uh, opens up a different uh, way uh, to look at therapeutic opportunities because drugs have actually been specifically developed to interfere which, with each of these acquired capabilities that are necessary for tumor growth and progression. Uh, so many of these are in clinical trials or uh, have been approved for clinical use. Um, and I just want to spend a moment uh, briefly looking at PARP inhibitors, which are a class of, of agents that target genomic instability. And so the key idea here is that DNA is actually damaged thousands of times during each cell cycle. Every cell in your body that's dividing will have nicks that occur uh, somewhere along the genome, uh, and that damage has to be repaired in order for the cell to proceed through the cell cycle. Uh, so PARP is a protein that's important for repairing these single-stranded breaks, these nicks. Uh, if these NICs are not repaired, so if we have an inhibitor against PARP, then during replication, those NICs turn into double-stranded breaks. 
And, um, and, and so these PARP inhibitors uh, have the effect of inducing hundreds to thousands of double-stranded breaks uh, in the genome of cells, which is okay in a normal cell that has a functioning uh, um, copy of BRCA1 or 2, because BRCA1 or 2 are involved in uh, repairing double-stranded breaks. In breast cancer cells that are mutated for BRCA, uh, so, they either, so they have homozygous loss of BRCA, uh, they cannot perform homologous recombination repair, uh, and so many double-stranded breaks accumulate that those cells die. So this is actually these two events, BRCA mutations and PARP inhib inhibition, are in a way synthetically lethal to one another. Either one on their own uh, is fine, the cells will survive, but if you put those together, they're synthetically lethal. Um, and so despite these tumors having a mutation in what is a, a tumor suppressor, uh, which are really hard to dar target with, uh, with small molecule drugs, um, we can take advantage of the synthetic lethality uh, to come up with a, effective uh, therapies in a different way. And so the, currently there are tests that will, uh, that, uh, will test for uh, BRCA1 and 2 um, uh, deletion or uh, mutations. Um, and in those cases where a woman has a, a BRCA mutant breast cancer or a germline mutation, um, she would be eligible for treatment with, with a number of these um, of drugs. I think two are approved, and then there are a number in clinical trials. So this is kind of a great example of stratifying patients um, based on driver genomic alterations, and then identifying combinations of tumor dependencies uh, that are an amenable in principle to um, targeted therapeutic intervention. Okay. So let's move on now to talking about some of the main confounding factors uh, that make copy number inference uh, challenging. Um, basically, this task is difficult for two main reasons, two or three main reasons. First of all, uh, cancer cells are nearly always intermixed with some unknown amount of normal cells. Um, and so this is referred to as tumor purity. And the actual DNA content of the cancer cell, or the ploidy of the cancer cell, is unknown at the beginning. So we don't know if their karyotypes are like those crazy ovarian cancers we looked at, where you might have six copies of the genome, or if it's a diploid tumor. But this will influence uh, I, the copy number analysis in a significant way. And then, of course, we also have uh, genetically divergent uh, lineages in a cancer sample, which may differ in, uh, at various loci in, in terms of gains or losses. And so when these values are unknown, they have to be estimated or predicted. Um, and often, there's more than one combination of purity and ploidy that can equally well describe uh, an observed copy number state. And so here are two examples. Uh, here are two examples of different combinations of purity and ploidy that give us the exact copy number. So in this first case, we have a homozygous deletion and a 30% tumor purity. So at this locus that's been homozygously deleted in the tumor, which is 30% of the sample, we have zero copies, so that's zero. And then we add two copies in the normal case uh, times 0.6, which is because normal cells make up actually 60% of the sample. So we get 1.2. Uh, and if we have a heterozygous deletion in a tumor with 60% purity, then we have the one copy that's left in 60% of cells and two copies in the normal cells that are in 30% of cells. So again, we get 1.2. And so we can't tell which one is more likely. Uh, um, or we need clever ways to tell which one is more likely. Uh, here's an equivalent, here's an, another example where we get equivalent copy number and uh, beta allele frequency. Um, so in one scenario, we have a, we start out with a diploid tumor where the heterozygosity is AB, so we have 50% heterozygosity, and we gain an A, so we have AAB. So our BAF is AAB. Or in another scenario, we have actually a tetraploid tumor, so we start with AABB, and we have a one copy loss, so we end up with AAB. In one case, we ended up there through a gain, in one case, we ended up there through a loss. And so knowing whether you've gained or lost that piece of DNA is kind of important, uh, and so purity and ploidy are something that need to be accurately estimated uh, from the data before we can do any more uh, uh, inference. And so computational tools have been developed to specifically address these problems. 
this is an overview of the absolute algorithm, um, which takes in process copy number segments and B allele frequency calls from a sample. Um, and it tries to infer the best combination of purity and ploidy, given, um, given that tumor's profile and also pre-existing uh, knowledge about cancer karyotypes. And so in this particular case, um, here in B, we see that we see a genome-wide view of copy ratios for allele A and B. And whenever we have a purple segment, A and B are uh, at equal ratios. And then whenever we have a divergence between blue and red, we have gains or losses of one or the other allele. And the gray and white bars are alternating chromosomes. So this is a genome-wide view. And here on the right, we have the sort of the sum, the, uh, the profile, uh, the whole genome profile of this tumor. And so we can see that there are, uh, that most of the genome is in this state, a my, uh, major minority is in this other state, and then there are some losses and additional gains up here. And so you can actually explain this copy number status uh, in at least three different ways. So at least three different uh, combinations of purity and ploidy, which are shown here on the bottom left. Um, so we can have, for instance, a ploidy of 4n, which means that each allele is at 2. So we have 2 and 2 for the maternal and paternal allele over most of the genome. And then in many cases, we would have a loss of one of those alleles, or gain of one of those alleles, or gain of both, or a subclonal gain. Um, we can also explain that copy number ratio with a ploidy of 7 or a ploidy of 1. Um, it turns out that a ploidy of 7 and 4 are the most equally probable. Uh, but if you look at cancer karyotypes, 7 is not as probable as 4. It's much more likely to have a tumor with a ploidy of 4 than a ploidy of 7. And so this algorithm takes into account your copy number state and then everything else that's known about cancer karyotypes in general and will make a call and a prediction and give you a prediction score for which purity and ploidy combination it inferred. <coughs> so taking this approach and then looking at purity and ploidy across 5,000 cancers, uh, it turns out that over a third of all cancers uh, have a, a ploidy greater than four, uh, meaning that they must have undergone a whole genome duplication event at some point in their evolutionary history. Uh, and so here we see that for uh, 12 different kinds of cancers um, across a range of different uh, purities. So some cancers are more pure than others, uh, but within each type you have some more pure samples and some less pure samples. Uh, there's a significant proportion of tumors that are diploid, so these are the purple samples. So they have a ploidy of two. Uh, but more than a third have undergone at least one genome duplication, and then a minority have undergone more than one genome duplication. So those are the green and the red. Um, and there's compelling evidence that genome doubling events um, actually happen fairly early in tumorigenesis. Um, so what this plot shows for um, broad events on the top and focal events on the bottom, and for gains in red and losses in blue, is that um, samples with whole genome duplication, which are for each cancer type, the bar on the right, um, there are more amplifications and deletions that occur after the genome duplication. So the way to read this graph, so the bar on the left is always the tumors in each type that are not duplicated, and the bars on the right are the ones that are duplicated, and we can tell which events must have happened before the duplication or after the duplication. So before, so if we look at the overall signal from uh, amplifications and losses that are broad, we can see that before tumor duplication, uh, some events happen, but a lot more happen afterwards. Um, and then in, uh, in whole genome duplicated tumors, we see a lot more events than in non-duplicated tumors. So whole genome duplication is kind of a hallmark of cancer instability. So you generate all these extra copies of every chromosome, and then you are free to lose various parts of your genome because you have backups. And unlike a diploid genome, where if you lose large chunks of your genome, uh, often that will cause a uh, cell cycle arrest uh, or death of that cell. And so losses um, are actually much more prevalent in these genome duplicated cases uh, than in non-genome duplicated cases. 
Okay, so one final example of the clinical relevance of genome doubling events in cancer. Uh, this is from a recently published cohort of 100 lung cancers where each patient tumor was genomically profiled um, using exome sequencing from multiple spatially separated uh, biopsies of the primary untreated tumor. So you can see here they took uh, four different biopsies and then they performed, um, this is the, just the conceptual design where they performed copy number analysis and mutation calling uh, done on each region. And this data can then be used to work out the phylogeny of this cancer. Um, and so the, this phylogenetic tree uh, really depicts the uh, mutational trajectory of this cancer. So it starts with some initiating events here in gray, a genome doubling event that happens fairly early on, a few more events that are found in every single cancer cell, and then branching of these uh, into different clonal lineages that have distinct mutations or copy number gains and losses. So these are subclonal events. Um, and so I I'm only going to highlight a few of the most relevant findings for our discussion now. Um, first, they found that nearly 50% of copy number alterations in these cancers, in these lung cancers, were subclonal. And that means they were restricted to a certain part of the tumor. Uh, second, without multi-regional sampling, 70% of the subclonal events um, would look clonal because you wouldn't know that they're missing in other cells. So if you just profile one biopsy, you'd be wrong 70% of the time that a clonal event is clonal uh, because it's in every cell of that specific region of the tumor but not elsewhere. Um, third, early genome doubling events were actually associated with higher levels of subclonal events, and the patients with high levels of subclonal events did a lot worse than patients without them. So genomic instability uh, in this disease is prognostic. Um, and then finally, this approach when considering mutations and copy number alterations uh, as a function of the whole cohort, which is sort of summarized here on the left, um, it, it really allows uh, us to classify genes into those that are uh, lost or gained or mutated before a genome doubling event and lost and gained and mutated after a genome doubling event. Uh, and so those that are lost or gained or mutated early are possible initiating events and these uh, later ones are possible maintenance events. And so when you think about uh, therapeutic targeting of lung cancers and you've just profiled one region and you've picked a clonal mutation uh, or alteration that you think is a driver and you're going to target it, it makes a difference um, if you had multi-regional sampling or not because that mutation may not actually be clonal. Um, and so this is kind of, this is a great paper. It goes over a lot of the concepts that we're going to talk about today and tomorrow and uh, I encourage you to read it if you get a chance on top of all your other reading. Um, okay, so let's Let's now talk about measurement technologies and computational methods. Uh, this slide essentially shows a progression of measurement technologies for copy number changes that range from low resolution and higher accuracy here on the left uh, to a middle ground that has a higher resolution uh, and coming to date with really high resolution and high accuracy uh, uh, measurement uh, technique, technologies like genotype arrays and whole genome sequencing. And so uh, I mentioned FISH already. This is a method where you can target a small number of, uh, of <coughs> loci or genes or regions of interest and look at their uh, copy number in a single cell um, resolution, which is great, but it's very laborious and it's not high throughput at all. Um, and then in the early 2000s, hybridization array platforms were developed. Uh, so these had between 30 to 100,000 probes. Um, so these were positions in the genome, and one would label a tumor and a normal sample, watch them on these arrays, and then look at the differences between the red and the green label. And so you could focus in on gains or losses in uh, a tumor sample versus a normal. But you had no information on uh, loss of heterozygosity or, or uh, B allele frequencies, for instance. And so uh, Affymetrics and uh, Illumina um, really drove the cancer genome analysis uh, copy number field um, uh, in the uh, later 2000s or mid-2000s with the advent of these uh, genotyping arrays. 
So these not only measure copy number, they measure the B allele frequencies of, of polymorphisms in the general population. And now, of course, we've moved on to 3 million differences uh, with whole genome sequencing. Uh, so we are really at a high resolution and, and a high accuracy end of the scale. Uh, and in today's lab, you're going to have a chance to look at both uh, array data, um, so Affymetrics array data and uh, whole, uh, end sequencing data. Okay, so from this data, we're going to try to infer uh, copy number gains and losses and loss of heterozygosity, which is not easy. So this is a challenging uh, a statistical inference problem. Uh, and I've already mentioned some of the challenges, normal contamination, so we have to account for purity, we have to account for uh, tumor ploidy, we have to account for the possibility that there are multiple genetic clones that are different in our cancer sample. Um, and uh, currently, uh, most experimental designs don't actually take multi-regional sampling, so we can't, uh, we can't use uh, multiple samples to infer whether something is clonal or not clonal. And so this is also a, a challenge. Uh, but basically, um, there are now statistical uh, tools that will perform this prediction of purity and ploidy and deconvolution of these mixtures of cells. Uh, which is a really important aspect of the, of the analysis. And if you want to review uh, some of these statistical considerations, uh, this is a really good paper by Terry Speed. Um, it's a good read in general and for the problem at hand. Um, and just to remind us before looking at some examples, uh, this is the kind of data that we're going to look at, or this is the uh, the, <coughs> the this is the basis for uh, the inference. Um, in other words, ideally normal samples where we have heterozygous or homozygous uh, polymorphisms and no copy number differences, um, tumors which may have duplications and changes in heterozygosity, so from a heterozygous state uh, to a loss of heterozygosity or to an altered um, genotype frequency. Uh, and then the quick reminder on genotype, in a diploid genome, we have the two alleles, A is the more prevalent in the population, and B is the, the least prevalent. So at every position, you'll have the C will be the A, and the T will be the B. And it's that, you use that A and B for, every, for everyone. Okay. So when we have two copies of the genomes, uh, there are three possible genotypes. Um, AA, AB, and BB. So that's shown up here. If the germline of the person is heterozygous at a particular SNP, and you see AB, then that position is still heterozygous. If you see A or AA, then that is loss of heterozygosity, BBB, loss of heterozygosity. When we have a copy number gain, uh, we now have four possible genotypes. Um, and so these are the ones we talked before where you're shifting away uh, in heterozy heterozygosity from 0.5. Um, so your beta allele frequency or your B allele frequency would be 0.3, 0.6, uh, 1, and 0. And same, by the time we get to 5, uh, copy, a copy number of 5, we can have 6 possible genotypes. And so these are the zygosity uh, states where we can have complete loss of heterozygosity, allele-specific copy number alterations, ASCNAs, or uh, re retention of heterozygosity. Um, and so we do want to ascertain what the uh, genotype actually is because we often want to know if the tumor has balanced heterozygosity or complete loss of one allele in favor of another because that actually tells us something about the biology of the disease. So it's important to do this process. Uh, here's an actual example of a SNP. Um, and so when we do, uh, when we infer the B allele frequency uh, in both arrays and sequence data, uh, that relies on measuring the relative frequency of the A and B allele um, at particular positions, and those positions we usually get from dbSNP. So dbSNP, the latest, so this is a database that warehouses um, all the polymorphic information um, for humans and, and other species as well. So in the latest version, dbSNP 150, there are about 130 million single nucleotide polymorphisms that have a known frequency in the human population. Uh, so here, oops, here are three examples. This is in the gene BRCA2. Um, 
and this gene has 8,200 such variations. So there are um, uh, a lot of them don't necessarily have uh, an allelic frequency that's known, but these three examples do. Um, these 8,200 <laughs> will actually mostly be non-coding. Um, and for each one, we can see what the alleles are. For instance, at this position in the genome, it's a T and a C. The global MAF stands for the global minor allelic frequency. So the C is the minor allele, and it's found in 0.009% or uh, in that, that, that's the proportion in the population, so 0.9%. Uh, this position is a GT. The G is the minor allele, and it's found in 37% uh, of people. So at this position, A, the A allele is T and the B allele is G. And same over here, we see that the T is found at such a rare uh, frequency in the population that you need more than three decimal places to, um, to write it down, and we only have three here. So that wouldn't be on a genotype array, for instance, because it's always going to be a CC, right? Almost no one will have the T, so it's useless to put it on the genotype array. Um, so on the Affymetrix genotype array, the SNP6 array, we have uh, probes that contain these polymorphisms. So these are 25 more oligonucleotide probes. There are almost a million of them, so 900,000 probes that uh, will uh, be a perfect match to each allele of the SNP. And then there are also almost 950,000 probes uh, that don't bind to SNPs, they bind to areas of the genome that are known to be uh, variant in terms of copy number in the general population. So these are the CND probes. Um, the average heterozygosity of SNPs on the array is 25%. So for each SNP, on average, it'll be heterozygous in 25% of people. It's kind of how to read that. And what we measure on this array are hybridization intensities. So each probe will bind to its target. So we uh, add the person's DNA uh, to the chip. And if there is binding, uh, it's a fluorescence-based um, uh, assay. And so we read out basically a continuous signal uh, of intensity. And because we know where each one of these polymorphisms are in the genome, we can, that's how we can make those plots uh, of signal along the chromosome, and we can see areas of gain or loss. Okay, so this is a little bit more detail about, oh, yeah. Sorry, um, so with the average heterozygosity, um, so it's on average 25 percent, so it's heterozygous in 25 percent of people, right? Yeah. Um, so in your own, across your own genome, are you so you have a 25% chance of being heterozygous at that one position. Okay. And then at some other position, you have a 25% chance of being heterozygous. And you have 900,000 of these positions. Okay. So chances are pretty good that you'll be heterozygous at like a lot of them. Um, if the average heterozygosity of these SNPs was 0.001, you would likely be homozygous at most of these positions. And so you would never be able to do uh, allelic ratios because it would always be zero and one. Yeah. So these were chosen specifically uh, to uh, um, sort of tip the scale in favor of finding um, heterozygous marks. And so the way that that works in the assay is that these so let's say we have a SNP of interest here. It's an A to a C. A is the red, C is the green. Um, the probes that are designed will be complementary to one or the other allele. So we have a probe here with a T, so that's complementary to the A, um, and a, a probe here with a G, which is complementary to the C. And not only do we have one probe uh, for each allele, we have multiple probes where the base uh, that's changing it's in the center of the probe or a few base pairs up or down. So we have about 20 probes per position uh, in a SNP6 uh, chip. And uh, let's assume that we have an individual who is homozygous for allele A. The DNA of this person will bind to the probe that has a T. It will bind to the other probe that has a T in a different position. But it will also bind to the probe that has a C. It's just that the binding is much weaker. So that binding, because it's not a perfect binding over the 25 base pairs, uh, that fragment will dissociate a lot of the time. And so the signal 
So there's always a background signal, um, but that signal will not be as strong as the ones from a perfect binding. And then same for a person who has the C allele, for instance, the DNA of that person will bind to the T or to the G, to the G, but also to the A. And so again, we'll, we're looking for a much increased uh, signal on the uh, on one of the the strands. And so the intensities are kind of summarized here on the right. We either have homozygous A, where we just see signal for the A, probes with the complementary to the A, homozygous B, which are the probes complementary to C in this case, um, or we'll see both probes light up or all probes light up, uh, which will be the case for. Uh, individuals that are heterozygous at this position. So this is the data that comes off the, um, or this is the data that we read, or that we read in the signal intensities. Okay, so people still use SNP6 arrays. Um, there's a wealth of data available out there um, from from large consortia. So TCJ, for instance, has um, 11,000 tumor samples profiled with SNP6. Um, across a range of different cancers, and many of these have other types of data, so expression or um, uh, methylation and so on. Uh, and until recently, there was no equivalent for other species, uh, or specifically for mouse, uh, but now there is a genotyping array for, my, for mice. And the way that it was designed, you can actually characterize a wide range of strains. Uh, so if you're working with model systems, this is probably pretty useful. So you could uncover genetic events uh, in mouse models of disease, for instance. And it would be the same type of analysis as we talk about for the, uh, for the human array. Um, so the workflow and part of what you'll do in the lab today uh, is to take uh, uh, genotyping arrays on the SNP6 platform where we're going to start with a cell file. So this is the data that comes off the, the machines. Uh, and the workflow is to pre-process the signals from these probes uh, and perform normalization so that we have signals that are comparable across the genome and across samples. Uh, and then this is followed by a couple of different extraction techniques, one on the left to generate calls for copy number, and then on the right to generate calls for uh, the B allele, the minor allele frequency. And then those measurements are processed with a statistical model that can infer um, where the copy number and B allele ratios uh, change across the genome. So when we go from one copy number state to another. Um, and then we can follow up once we have those segments of gain and loss or LOH, uh, we can follow up with uh, some of the activities you'll do in the other modules like finding genes uh, that are overrepresented in these regions or looking at pathways uh, that, may be, um, that may be hit uh, significantly. And so this is the workflow for SNP6, but it's really generalizable to, uh, to sequencing data as well. Um, and just a, a quick note that for any kind of data, uh, normalization is absolutely required uh, to remove platform-induced artifacts. And so the probes are actually not really specific. They will actually hybridize with other parts of the genome. Um, there's that background signal I mentioned. Um, the degree of hybridization can be uh, affected by the length of the DNA fragments, for instance, um, and the probe may have worse binding in the presence of mutations or if there's clusters of SNPs, so some filtering can be done there as well. And so you need um, a, a package, for instance, like the Aroma Affymetrix package uh, that handles a lot of these artifacts um, and does the normalization so that the experiments um, are comparable with each other and you have outputs which are copy number and B allele frequencies which actually reflect biology and not the artifacts of the platform. Okay, so once we have normalized data, we can start to infer copy number aberrations, LOH, allele specific changes. Uh, and so again, here are just uh, a couple of examples of some very clean signals, uh, especially for the, um, for the B allele ratio uh, for gains and losses. So here we see a small gain, uh, here we see copy neutral LOH, and so on for this um, and, in this, um, and in this slide, I'm just listing a number of methods um, for high-density genotype arrays, uh, including OncoSNP, uh, which I think is the one that we're going to use in the lab, uh, as well as Absolute, which I talked about um, earlier. Okay. So the copy number field was predominated by genotyping arrays for many years, uh, and in relatively recently, uh, whole genome sequencing have been routinely performed um, as the cost of sequencing has dropped. So I think 
It currently costs $1,400 to do a 30x uh, genome and um, much less to do uh, an exome. I think it's about 650. Uh, but basically, in a whole genome or exome experiment, libraries are essentially made, you, you've heard of this, or a version of this already, but you make libraries by sharing or fragmenting DNA, and then um, selecting some fragments that have a reasonable size, for instance, 300 base pairs, and then sequencing from both ends of, of, of each fragment. So you have, so here in this diagram we see a fragment, and the sequenced parts are these orange um, or these orange ends. And so what we can see in a, in a, a sequencing experiment is that um, coverage corresponds to copy number. And so we might infer that the average coverage is a diploid genome. And then changes in coverage um, where we have more reads would be gains. And changes in coverage where we have less reads would correspond to deletions. And then areas of the genome where we don't have any reads uh, would be homozygous deletions. Um, and sequencing reads also give us the allelic ratio at mutations and single nucleotide polymorphisms. Uh, so we can infer B allele frequencies in an analogous way to array data. Um, of course, we do this by read counts instead of intensity signals. Uh, and, and actually, that's um, one of the major differences between these two uh, platforms because we're going from an analog technology to a digital one. So we're going from intensities to, uh, to counts. Um, not surprisingly, whole genome data is also subject to different biases. So uh, GC content is actually a major culprit uh, to uh, uh, contributing to, to changes in coverage that are not due to, co to copy number. And so uh, we see here in, these, in this plot on the top left um, that regions with a high GC content have a higher coverage. There is a correlation. Um, and so this is an aspect of the data that we need to account for and correct. Uh, and regression techniques are typically used to correct this bias. So after correction, we see that read coverage uh, or read counts are no longer correlated with GC counts. So we want to remove this. And then another interesting feature of genomes is mappability. Um, and so lots of, lots of uh, areas in our genome are repetitive sequences. And if you cannot uniquely align a sequence, um, you have low mappability. So there's this inverse correlation of mappability or read coverage with uh, repeats. And this is also something that we should and can correct. So these are the two main things to correct. So when we do pre-processing on sequencing data, we take data that looks like this. So when we look across this particular chromosome, we see that if we look in 1,000 uh, base pair bins um, and count the read coverage uh, or copy number, we can see that there's a variation that goes up and down. And once we correct for GC, this variation is uh, a lot of that is gone. And once we correct for mappability and GC, we are left with a pretty clean signal where it's very easy to infer um, that a copy number event uh, uh, so a gain or a loss is happening. Uh, so in the lab, you'll use Titan, which has uh, this processing built into it. And then once we have pre-processed and normalized data, uh, segmentation is applied to infer which of these contiguous uh, regions have concordant copy number and B allele frequencies. Uh, so we go from these plots that have all these black dots to these plots where different colors uh, denote different segments with concordant copy number uh, uh, states. So you can see about 30 different segments here. Um, so here we have, it's very hard to read, blue is, oops, blue is zero. And then you can see there's a gain. And then another copy, neutral. And then a, heteros a homozygous loss, a heterozygous loss, a subclonal loss another heterozygous loss, another piece of normal. We're missing information at the centromere because that is one of the low mappability areas. It's full of repeats. So we often don't have signals at centromeres and telomeres. Um, and then we keep going like this. Um, OK, so this is just an example of <clears throat> a genome that was processed with a tool called Apollo, which is the precursor to the tool you'll use in the lab, Titan. Um, and this compares, uh, this is from the publication that compared um, SNP array data, which was the gold standard, to doing this kind of analysis using whole genome data. And so these data sets were generated from the same aliquot of DNA. Um, and you can see that they have really concordant calls. Um, and 
this tool also takes into account um, a stromal parameter, SP. So this is this reflects the amount of normal contamination in the um, sample, copy number, so it infers the ploidy of your tumor sample. Um, and SC is um, spatial correlation, and I think that's just um, a metric that will account for how far away your um, um, heterozygous positions are. Okay, so whole genome is cheap. I mentioned compared to a few years ago, whole exome is even cheaper. It's about $650. Uh, so there's actually a lot of interest in performing this type of, of analysis on exomes. Um, but they only give you about 1 to 2 percent of the data you get from a whole genome. And so um, a lot of people who work with exomes and TCGA is dominated by exome capture data uh, want to perform copy number and um, LOH analysis uh, on this type of data. Um, and so that's actually very possible. Um, you can get fairly good specificity and sensitivity in finding deletions and amplifications. Uh, it's not very good for finding areas of LOH. Often the borders are very fuzzy and you don't have a lot of statistical power because you don't have as many heterozygous positions. There are not that many SNPs in the exome compared to the genome. And so often LOH is, uh, suffers in exome data. Uh, but it is possible to analyze copy number and uh, LOH from exomes. Control Freak will only do copy number. Titan does both copy number and LOH. Um, and here are just some examples of from Control Freak where it corrects for GC content and mappability and generates these nice plots. Although you can see that the dots are much more sparse than, um, than in whole genome data. Um, okay, so this is again that super clean example of the typical features we look for in a copy number analysis. Uh, this doesn't give us anything about subclonal events, um, which we know are prevalent in cancer genomes. And so how can we find those? Uh, they actually show up as weaker signals um, that are centered around non-integer copy numbers. So here we see uh, this region is a copy number loss of 1, and these uh, this other region is a copy number loss of 0.5. So this is a subclonal event. It is not in 100% of cells. And so there are tools uh, like Titan which can predict subclonal events and deconvolute the likely lineages that are present in the sample. So for instance, in this case, uh, we have this clonal event, this loss, uh, which happens early on. It's in 100% of cells. We have uh, heterozygous loss. And then there's a subclonal cluster, uh, this cluster 2, which involves deletion of this region and this region. And that explains why you would have um, a copy number of, of 0.5, basically, in or sorry, of 1.5 instead of uh, 1 at these regions. So tools will attempt to, with information from purity and ploidy, deconvolute the remaining signal into, uh, into subclonal populations. So in um, the conceptual framework for this tool is that we ideally profile a matched normal and tumor sample. Uh, we extract the positions in the genome that are heterozygous in the normal. So here are two examples uh, where we see that both of these um, alleles are around 50%. Um, and then we look in the tumor and we uh, determine whether the heterozygosity is retained or lost, so L and H. Um, and typically that's, there are about 2 to 3 million SNPs per individual. Um, and at each of these positions, we basically count the alleles. And so we apply then a statistical model that takes genotypes and coverage as input and tries to learn where the copy number and um, uh, LOH segments are, and then tries to determine their cellular prevalence, which uh, schematically kind of looks like this. Let's say we have a tumor with a mixture of cells corresponding to two genotypes. Um, the first has a deletion and a gain. This gen the, the deletion and again and basically 100% of cells in this genotype. The second to, uh, lineage has just the deletion and no gain. And so the idea is that uh, when you mix these, um, these two lineages together and then add in some normal contamination, you have a mixture of lineages and the confounding factor of uh, lower tumor purity. And so you have a signal like this where you have the loss, which retains its 
signal because it's in every cancer cell, and the gain whose signal is suppressed because it is not in every cancer cell. So now we see it as proportional to the amount of cancer cells that were uh, in that lineage uh, with a gain. And so the task of these tools is basically to, to account for normal contamination and deconvolute um, the events that are in both or single lineages. Okay, so benchmarking says we can do this pretty well. We can do this pretty well compared to other tools. Uh, we can do this with high precision at various mixing ratios of those two lineages. Uh, so where one lineage is closer to 0% or 100%. Um, and it shows that the corresponding population structure, um, or that considering this population structure, increases sensitivity to subclonal events. So you need to account for this to find the subclonal events. If you don't have this as a parameter in your statistical tool, um, uh, then your chances of finding subclonal events is significantly reduced because you're essentially treating them as noise. Okay, so here's an example where we applied uh, Titan to exome data from brain tumors uh, that were in many cases highly genetically heterogeneous. So genetic heterogeneity in this case is uh, just illustrated here as different colors. So these are cells in a tumor. And we picked multiple regions uh, from these tumors to sequence. And I'm just showing you here three, uh, four examples on the right of some high-grade gliomas and some medulloblastomas. And we can see that uh, a lot of the genome is copy neutral, that's gray. Um, and then we can see on the, for each region, so one, two, three, four, five, six, um, in this high-grade glioma we had eight regions. Uh, for each region we can see copy number gains on top in red and losses on the bottom. And the intensity of the color indicates how clonal that event is. So uh, in medulloblastoma, loss of 9Q, uh, 9Q is an early event. That is a, essentially, it's, um, it's one of the events that takes out patch, which is a tumor suppressor. So you mutate patch on one copy and then you lose the other copy and duplicate it or you just lose the other copy. So you're left with a mutated copy of patch. Uh, so that's an early event. And then in, um, I think in the glioblastomas, you have gain of 7 and loss of 10, which are early, early events. Uh, but there are plenty of events that look clonal in one region and are not found anywhere else in the tumor, uh, or that are subclonal everywhere, which means probably that there is a different part of the tumor we didn't profile, let's say this purple region, where that uh, where that event is actually clonal. Um, and there are many examples, if, if you can look at these plots for a while, uh, where just profiling one biopsy doesn't actually give you the true copy number state of these tumors. And so this is just like the lung cancer study uh, that shows that in 70, showed that in 70% of copy number aberrations, they weren't really clonal when you looked at other regions of the tumor. OK, so let's finish with kind of a nod towards emergent technologies. Uh, technologies that have a goal of deconvoluting mixtures of genetic lineages uh, so that we can understand population structures. And um, this is directly achieved with single cell sequencing. And so you can sequence hundreds to thousands to hundreds of thousands of uh, single cells um, by uh, purifying nuclei from cells. Um, and in contrast to sequencing a bulk tumor and then applying fancy algorithms to deconvolute the signal into likely lineages. Instead, uh, we are directly measuring the copy number gains and losses in each cell. So a subclonal event found in only subset of cells, you know exactly what uh, events go together. So you know uh, exactly what is happening in each cell. Now, um, the data is not necessarily cheap or easy to produce. Um, or easy to work with, and it's not bias-free, but there are many ongoing efforts that actually uh, work to couple single-cell uh, profiling with, with bulk measurements um, and gain insight into, into this clonal heterogeneity. And so as the technology evolves and becomes cheaper, we'll see more and more insight into clonal evolution uh, from these types of experiments. Okay, so just to summarize, genome architecture is a fundamental uh, aspect of cancer. Uh, somatic copy number alterations change gene dosage, uh, so drivers will often have uh, concordant uh, gains or losses or increases or decreases in their expression. 
we can measure these alterations using um, arrays-based technologies or next-gen sequencing. Um, the properties of the genomes that, that we can um, learn about through copy number profiling actually can highlight therapeutic opportunities um, if we do the analysis right. Uh, and so we need to, um, uh, to account for all the caveats that I talked about in order to be able to infer the biological signal um, and infer the structure of the clonal populations within bulk samples. Okay, so I'm going to leave you with a set of tools. Um, we'll use Titan and OncoSnip in the lab and hopefully fill up on coffee so that we can keep going for another few minutes this afternoon. Thank you.